masters of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and sitting in this week for Gary Kildall is Herb Lechner of SRI. Herb, our subject today is ergonomics, or human factors engineering, looking at how computers and people can work better together. And uh, most people may not recognize this monster here. This is an Apple I computer from back in 1977. Uh, you supply the lumber by yourself, by the way. It's not very user-friendly. Uh, you've done a study at SRI on ergonomics. What were the findings of that study? Well, we didn't have anything quite this crude to work with, uh, Stuart, but we did find that there are areas in which we can improve the man-machine interface. Uh, they range from hardware-specific items, like the design of the keyboards and the height of the uh, characters, to the furniture, to the general workspace, the uh, room for uh, work layout, the heat, the noise level, the lighting, and uh, all the way to personnel issues such as uh, making sure that the people are going to use the equipment are part of the selection and decision-making process. Okay, on today's program, we'll be looking at the newest chapter from Apple, looking at the Macintosh and how it approaches ergonomic problems. First of all, let's, let's take a look at some human engineering problems in which the consequences are more serious than just eye strain or inconvenience. The sophisticated aircraft instruments developed in the 1940s and 50s created human interface problems that were entirely new to industrial designers. Mechanical devices gave way to electromechanical and electronically controlled mechanisms, generating more information more rapidly and putting greater burdens on the operator. In its earliest days, ergonomics was concerned with the safety of people who used these devices in applications where an error could cause injury or loss of life. As the use of ergonomic design became more common, it quickly spread to other working environments with the goal of increasing productivity and reducing fatigue and stress. Among computer users, some major concerns surfaced in the 1970s. Muscular pain, stress, and in particular eye fatigue were the most common health complaints. Sitting in front of a video display was a radical change for most workers and led to studies on how the eye responds to CRT stimuli. In this experiment, an infrared beam follows the eye's movement across the screen, measuring pupillary responses and focusing ability when faced with characters of different polarity, sharpness, or contrast. The irritation resulting from screen glare, another major source of complaints, is measured by this test, in which different patterns at varying contrast levels are projected onto a CRT screen. As each pattern changes, the subject looks for its reflection in the screen difference between an anti-glare and a reflective screen is easy to demonstrate. Ergonomics developed as designers became aware of an obvious relationship. The efficiency of a machine depends on how efficiently it can be handled. In a field where the problems are sometimes physical and sometimes psychological, the objective is the same, to adapt machine design to human thought and movement. Our guests in the studio now are Wanda Smith, manager of Human Factors Engineering at Hewlett Packard, and Karen Kessel, an ergonomics consultant and editor of the Office Systems Ergonomic Report. Herb? Uh, Karen, not everyone may be familiar with our use of the term ergonomics. Some people think it has something to do with the interaction between people and computers, but there are software interactions and there are physical interactions. Uh, how, how do you define ergonomics in this sense? Well, basically in that way, that uh, you must consider the entire workstation design, and that, of course, includes the terminal and the systems operation, which is both software and uh, the task. What we try to do is look at the user and ask, what are the user's needs? Uh, what, how is the user constrained in this task? How are they, how are they constrained in that? what are their memory capabilities, for example, and try to tailor the environment so that it best suits them. Wanda, when you look at a, a computer terminal or keyboard, more or less it reminds you of a typewriter. Is one of the problems people are kind of caught in that typewriter mode and, and not really thinking that this is a really different machine to be using? 
Yes, I think there are some tr what we call transfer of training problems, particularly with people who have never used a terminal before, uh, in other words, a keyboard hooked up to a computer, and sometimes that's evident when people continually hit the return or a button on the right that might erase all the data. As normally they think of that return button as returning the type element back to the left side of the paper, and what happens with a terminal is that you actually return the cursor to the left-hand side of the terminal. So there is a problem with transfer of training, but it seems to be overcome very quickly. Not too long ago, there was quite a bit of concern expressed by VDT users about their safety and about the physical comfort of using a VDT terminal. I've noticed some changes since then, uh, detachable keyboards and all, mm -hmm. but what actually transpired there? Well, actually, several years ago, this, um, the concern of the users was brought to the attention of the manufacturers, and there was some legislation started in Europe, and as a result of the concern mainly, but also of the legislation, there's been a number of de product design changes that really better accommodates the user and makes the whole system more adaptable and more flexible for the user. Karen, looking at the hardware side a second, what are the, what are the ergonomics issues you face here? We think of things like screens and, and keyboards and what else? Okay, uh, yeah, lighting, uh, character quality, uh, other aspects of the physical workstation that include uh, things like if uh, you're using your terminal a good deal of the time and also having to get information from a telephone, you don't want to put the telephone across the room, you want it close to you. So it's considering the entire workstation, uh, in particular uh, concerning the VDT, we're concerned about the screen quality. Um, what, what should the keyboard be like? These kinds of issues. What about on the software side? It seems that's a more subtle problem, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, it's also a more difficult issue uh, because then you're asking questions about the cognitive capabilities of the user. You're sometimes asking, given a, a certain goal, uh, what stages is the user going to go through to get there? Basically, what are they going to be thinking of? You're trying to anticipate them and you're trying to design a system that better accommodates them. And that's very difficult. And I suppose we have question. to be a little flexible. Uh, all users are not the same. There are exactly. tall people and short people. And, uh, exactly. Various users come to the VDT situation with uh, different kinds of knowledge. We have adjustable chairs, but I wonder if we have adjustable software. W Wanda, speaking of cognitive problems, you have a demonstration here with the, with the HP Orion computer. Tell us what's on there. <laughs> this is a demonstration of um, a time planning algorithm that's typical. It's in the field known as a PERT chart. And <clears throat> this is a demo of how this kind of information um, can be changed to multicolor in order to um, pick out the information on the screen that differentiates it from other parts of activities that will be going on during this person's planning of time. Okay, um, so what we saw first was a black and white chart, which wasn't too easy to decipher. Well, it was easy to see the information, but it wasn't easy to differentiate the information. One of the advantages of this display is that it has 4,029 colors, and we can vary the colors um, on parts of this display to show uh, areas that need to be differentiated and that actually help the user to discriminate parts of the information on the screen from other sections. You can see that I've color-coded the critical path in this area red. I've color-coded the slack time in green. And now what I'll do is I'll color the events with a yellow to discriminate those particular parts of the screen or the events from others. You can see it's kind of a yellowish, goldish color. Okay, that certainly makes it easier to, easier to read. You have another demonstration on text processing, which I think is um, worth Yes, looking at. many people don't realize that um, you can use multicolor displays for um, applications like text, text processing. Most of the time, they think of multicolor displays for CAD CAM. And what I'm actually going to do now is to bring up a menu showing you something that I've designed to show how to discriminate sections of information in a letter by using a multicolor dimension. Um, most people, when they, they write a letter to a customer, let's say I've got an, a, a shipping account, what I, what I want to do is to find out what parts of 
the, the letter are critical information and what parts of the letter are typical information that we might want to change on a daily basis, <coughs> excuse me, or, or maybe not change at all. Now this takes a few seconds to bring up the program, but it's, it, it's an application that's new, it's different than CAD CAM. And we're starting to use multicolored displays to study the visual and cognitive responses of, of people, which as Karen said before, is a much more difficult problem than just the hardware design. This application would be if, for example, you wanted to edit a standard letter? Yes, yes. It's, it could be used for editing. It can, you can use multicolored uh, coding for um, defining technical terms in a report that you may want mm -hmm. to put into a glossary. This is an example where the standard text is color coded in blue. The information that you normally change when you do a, a new letter maybe to a new customer is color coded in yellow and the information that's critical is color coded in kind of a, a maroon color <laughs> and particularly if you notice the last line says continued non-receipt of this payment will jeopardize future orders and that will alert the data input <clears throat> operator to the fact that this person either hasn't made his payment or there's some problem um, alerting him to the fact that maybe we don't want to send that person orders in the future or at least tell the payments received. Wanda, one last thing. In doing your demo, I see you have a kind of thumb wheel, <coughs> speaking of ergonomics, on the keyboard. That's, I, that's kind of a, a mouse of a sort, isn't it? Well, it is a mouse. What it does, actually, it moves the cursor um, around the display so that you can put various types of information at different spots on the, the screen. Now one of the advantages of a thumb wheel designed into a keyboard is that it doesn't require a lot of space, space on the tabletop as would a mouse or maybe some other kind of interface device. Um, one of the things that we're interested in as human factors engineer is what kind of device should be used for a typical user in a specific application. And that's the kind of analysis we go through to design a product for specific users. Okay, in just a moment, we'll take a look at one of the newest chapters in Apple Computer's approach to ergonomic design, the Macintosh, and that's coming up next. Joining us now is Susan Kerr. Susan is an icon designer with the Macintosh Software Group and Jerry Manick, who's product design manager for Macintosh. Uh, we're talking, Jerry, about ergonomics on this show. How did the Mac address some of the ergonomics problems we've been discussing? Uh, there are certain basic uh, design criteria that we use for keyboards, the angle of keyboards, the uh, angle of the front screen of the Macintosh. Uh, taken out of the literature, uh, we wanted Macintosh to be able to be used by the 99th percentile uh, male, female. Also, by we knew that children would be using the Macintosh. Uh, that pretty much decided uh, the arrangement of the tube above the disk drive slot. Uh, we wanted the keyboard to be very light, to be able to be moved around easily. Uh, Macintosh itself, uh, we wanted the case to be as small as possible because it's a, a portable unit. We wanted a very strong statement of transportability, thus the handle on the top. Uh, we wanted the keyboard to be able to be easily connected and disconnected. Uh, the uh, four uh, wire coil cord uh, plugs into the front of Macintosh to, to make it easy to uh, assemble it. Uh, the disk drive is, is pretty unique. We think the, uh, we've gone away from the soft floppy disks that can be easily damaged with heat or uh, bringing something magnetic close to it. Uh, this hard plastic shell on the disk drive, uh, on the uh, diskette, uh, completely protects the media inside and can be used, uh, carried in your pocket without worry about uh, getting dirty or damaged. Uh, it also makes the disk drive very reliable in any, practically any climate. You can be assured that you won't lose data by using that. Tell, tell us about the mouse. That's obviously been a key part of Lisa and now Mac uh, technology. Uh, the mouse is a, a very efficient cursor pointing device. There have been a lot of studies uh, about how the most efficient way to point the cursor is. Uh, Actually, the mouse is designed to be used all the way from a child to an adult with a very light touch on your hand. Uh, the early mice, even uh, from Apple, had three buttons or two buttons on top. We worked very hard to get just the button to be a single button without having to have the person remember uh, right or left, just, just click. And uh, as Susan will show you later, the function is, uh, is done. Uh, Susan, you're, you're an icon designer, among other things. and. Uh, 
Uh, have you learned something from the experience on Lisa as to the effectiveness of icons, how to use them, and how they fit in? Well, certainly, um, I think one of the best experiences is seeing a person who's never used a Lisa before or a Mac before, um, and even never used a computer before, it is possible, easily possible, to teach most people to use one of these computers in about 20 minutes. And a lot of that is because you can explain what an icon means and a person can remember it easily. So we certainly use Lisa as a jumping off point and making just some refinements and additions for some new features. Okay, your area, the icons, are another one of the key ergonomic aspects, I suppose, of using a Mac. Maybe you can run through a demonstration here, Susan, and show us how we use the icons to get from place to place. Tell us where we are right at this moment with Mac. Well, what you see now is the image, the icon that you get when you just plug Mac in and turn it on. It prompts you with a picture of the diskette. See? So and a question mark saying, where's my diskette? Saying, mm -hmm. I need something. Okay, so. so that all you do is, it only fits in one way, so there's no way you can break it or make a mistake. You just pop it in. You get an image of a content Mac, so you know that everything is OK. And you're welcomed. It's just so that the person using Mac gets information all the time, visually, so nothing has to be translated. A little wristwatch to tell you just Wait one second. Things are happening. You, you've replaced the uh, salt timer. Yeah. <laughs> We're this is moving into watch. moving okay. into the 80s. So what do we have now? So what we have now is an image on the screen of the diskette that we put in the slot, and it can be with the mouse. It can be moved. Okay. And um, it's already showing you the name of that disk. Right, and it's highlighted in the sense that it's inverted, so that Mac knows that you want to do something to this diskette and your choices of what you might want to do are listed in hidden menus that operate a little bit like window shades when you move your okay. cursor. So let's pull down the file menu mm -hmm. to see, that would tell us now what? Right, that our choices, we could find out something about this diskette or we can just open it or we could eject it, but if we open it, just say open and immediately you get what we call a window that displays graphically and in words what is contained on the diskette in the machine. So you can see there's a picture of a hand painting which symbolizes a paint program and a handwriting for the word processor and a couple of uh, memos that were already written, some folders. If say you want to store a document or two in a folder, um, it's analogous to life. You just put the piece of paper in the folder. Now you've got something called the control panel here. Show me what that is. Um, always available to you are a number of desk accessories. Um, so you move the cursor to control panel, let go of the mouse button. And what do we have? So this, which looks a little bit like a dashboard, um, lets you fine-tune the system in a number of ways to your comfort level or just your personal preferences. Um, the computer will work no matter what setting. So that Such as, what controls do you have? Say, here? here's a little volume control. You can see the speaker. So every now and then you hear a beep with Mac when you turn it on, um, or sometimes during uh, applications. If you're at home by yourself and you're listening to the stereo, you might want to know that you'll always hear those beeps. Mm -hmm. If you're a student working in the library, you can move it so that just the bar will flash so there's no noise at all. Say some of the other features let you adjust keyboard repeat rate or a menu flash or the amount of time between double clicks, which might vary with the age of the person using right, I'm gonna, the computer. I'm going to rush you because I want to see as much of this as we can in the time we have. Sh show me Notepad and okay. how that works. We can pop, pop the control panel away by just clicking on it. And Notepad lets yeah. you while you're working in any application, as well as just this, um, f what we call the finder, which is like a directory, mm -hmm. be able to um, grab the keyboard and write a note to yourself. Uh, remember to um, read page 12. And you could say, put this away, or you could move it over. Um, Show me how you flip <laughs> the pages of the notepad. That's kind of impressive. We can go to page two, where it says uh, another note, one left for oneself. Flip to page three, um, up to eight pages of notes that could 
help you in your work or just remind you of social events. Um, One of the items was, uh, was scrapbook. Right. Um, scrapbook lets you keep um, literally, you're only up to 256, you're only limited by how much memory you have free. Pictures or messages or documents always available for the terms we use are cutting and pasting. Maybe you can go to Mac Write and then we could build up to how you'd use that. Right. So say to open a word processor application, you could click on Mac Write and say open. If you want to get right to a document, which automatically launches the application, same procedure, which is why it's easy to use. And now you're loading the, the word processing. We're loading the word Mac processor Write. and the, to the specific document that I think one of the advantages, selected. too, of Macintosh is that things happen so quickly. Uh, it certainly fits into the ergonomic pattern of, of the user interacting quickly with the, with the device. It's just very direct, no complicated sequence of commands to remember. We can, here's a, an old little bit of sample text. This is how the word processor appears to you. Um, a ruler lets you set formats, which is certainly a familiar object. Say, you want to go from single to double space, just click on the wider image if you want. And you can justify or center. We're not going to have time, actually, but you could have pulled up pictures from Mac Paint from the scrapbook and then insert them and into the document. Paste also. them in just by saying paste from the menu. If you want to change a word to be bold, just say bold. <laughs> change the font to something like Old English. Okay, I know you're having fun, Susan, <laughs> but I'm going to have to stop you. It's hard when it's, when it's your baby not I, to be I, I, I get the feeling. Well, thanks so much for showing off Mac to us, and thanks for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. visual programming tools for software development is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine. In the Random Access file, the computer will soon be more than just a teaching tool in colleges. It is becoming the college itself. A company named Telelearning Systems has announced the creation of the first nationwide computer college offering credit and degrees for taking courses on a computer. Telelearning Systems will be working with seven major colleges and universities around the country to offer the computer courses. The schools are located in Ohio, Nebraska, California, Wisconsin, New Jersey, and New York. It's being called the Electronic University. Four Japanese computer companies have announced a major breakthrough in chip technology, the world's first one megabit ROM chip. The chip is 15 thousandths of an inch thick, yet it can hold one million bits of information, the equivalent of about 70 pages of printed material. The chip, which is smaller than the head of a thumbtack, has nearly half a mile of conductive wiring in it. The chip was developed by Hitachi, NEC, Toshiba, and the NTT Electrical Laboratory of Tokyo. Scientists at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California say they have just unveiled the world's fastest computer, a new Cray XMP supercomputer, which can do 200 million calculations per second. Scientists at the Livermore Lab will be using the Cray supercomputer to do research on the so-called Star Wars defense system. 
Texas Instruments has announced a new voice interface for its professional line of computers. The device will allow users to communicate with the computer by speaking up to 50 different commands. The voice interface costs $2,600 and will be available in April. And KPro has announced that it will soon market a new IBM-compatible notebook-size portable computer. KPro says it will be priced at the high end more expensive than current KPro models. Giant IBM, meanwhile, seems to be moving ahead to secure its dominant share in the personal computer market. There are rumors that IBM will soon take aim on the clones. The introduction of the IBM Portable, one step in that direction. Other rumored moves include greatly increased product production, a drop in prices, wider distribution, and the possibility of a new computer that would be harder to imitate. To appreciate the size of IBM's dominance, the increase in IBM computer sales last year, just the increase was $6 billion. And IBM scored a big victory last week. The Harvard Business School has settled on IBM as the required computer for all students. The business school announced that as of next fall semester, all students will be expected to own an IBM portable for use in homework assignments. Harvard College, however, decided to go with Apple and is making Macintosh the official student computer. Apple, meanwhile, got sued last week by shareholders complaining about alleged misrepresentations on the Lisa computer. The class action suit also charges that Apple officials sold more than 2 million shares of stock prior to the company's announcement of lower profits. Well, if you like chess and Dungeons and Dragons, you might like Archon, a new software game. That's the subject of this week's software review. Here's Paul Schindler. Games. Some people don't take them very seriously today, although we know, for example, that chess was taken quite seriously in India, where it was invented 13 centuries ago. We also know that kids who drop billions on arcade games play for keeps. Well, so does a company in San Mateo, California, called Electronic Arts. It's said that games on home computers, for technical reasons, can't hope to match the experience of games in an arcade. Well, someone forgot to tell the people at Electronic Arts. Today, we'll look at their game called Archon. Now, since I was playing with a chess set and we started, you might think Archon is a chess game. It isn't. There are plenty of chess games. But there are few games with men and women of magic, the forces of light and dark. The Whole Earth Software Catalog calls Archon an addictive cross between Dungeons and Dragons and chess. Well, with the goblins, the unicorns, and the colorful graphics, it may be hard to see the resemblance until you play it a little. Electronic Arts credits the authors of Archon, so we will too. They're Anne Westfall, John Freeman, and Paul Reich III. Archon costs $40 from Electronic Arts. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. And next week, Paul looks at Authix, a new low-cost word processing and filing program. Well, do you remember that video movie store in the neighborhood that used to sell mainly records? Well, you may soon be talking about the software store that used to sell books. Software is expanding outside the computer store and into bookshops. Two major book chains are already carrying software. And just last week, a major book publisher, Addison Wesley, got into the business of distributing Infocom's software to retail bookstores. Finally, if you're into self-evaluation, trying to find out who the real you is, there's a new software program to help you. It's called Unbecoming a Hero. The program takes you through an extended series of questions to help you figure out what are the values most important to you. The program also lets you create a role model and then helps you understand why you admire that kind of person. It costs $30 and it runs on an Apple. And that's it for this week's Random Access File. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine.